Welcome everyone. My name is Cassidy Diamond. I am the director, uh, associate director of public programs and events here at the International Documentary Association. Uh, thank you for joining us for this conversation around Netflix's shorts program moderated by Variety's Janelle Riley. Before we get started, I would like to offer a brief land acknowledgement. I'm coming to you today uh, from Chicago, which is on the unceded land of the Potawatomi people who have been stewards of this land for generations. I would also like to thank uh, IndieWire for their support of our screening series this year. And as always, you can check out our upcoming screenings at documentary dot org slash screenings dash series. And without any further ado, I'm going to hand things over to Janelle to get the conversation started. Hi, my name is Janelle Riley. I'm an editor at Variety. And thank you so much for joining us today for this IDA conversation with Netflix Shorts. At this time, please join me in welcoming today's guests. We have the directors of Camp Confidential, America's Secret Nazis, Daniel Sivan and Moore Lushi. From the film <laughs> Audible, <laughs> from the film Audible, director, producer, Matt Ogans. Hi. And from Lead Me Home, directors, Pedro Koss and John Shank. Thanks for having us. Thank you all so much for being here. Uh, I want to start at the beginning with each of you and sort of how your films came to be, because I know particularly in the documentary world, you might start off with one idea and end up with something completely different. Um, so I'd love to start with Daniel and more because Camp Confidential is the story of a secret POW camp that was classified for over five decades. So when did you become aware of this story and what made you see it you know, as filmic? Uh, we just wrapped our work on The Devil Next Door that is a Netflix documentary dealing with the Holocaust and we really didn't want to do any other topic. <laughs> it, was, it, it was really, really tough for us emotionally. And we had producers, Jono and Benji Bergman that came to us with this idea. And at first we just didn't believe them. Like we said, like, ah, you have to get it wrong. It's like, it's a Nazi camp during the second world war with Jews as the guards, and then they actually recruit the Nazis, and it was just so out there. And then they showed us that actually there are these audio tapes of all these veterans that are no longer living. And once we heard those voices, we just said, like, okay, this has to be our next project. I remember the first time that, you know, we actually heard the interviews and it was absolute a chill because such vividly uh, testimonies and, you know, the subject that was very, very secretive. It was a very dark place, you know, like a dark place in, in America, a secret that has been hidden for years. And to hear these testimonies, <clears throat> I mean, we couldn't say no. <laughs> Matt, for you, um, Audible centers on students at the Maryland School for the Deaf, primarily this athlete, Amari McKenstry. How did you come to know either this subject or this person? Yeah, a few ways. Um, so multiple factors led me to it. I grew up in Maryland, D.C., about 30 miles away from Maryland School for the Deaf, so I was familiar with it. Um, as I mentioned, my aunt still is a sign language interpreter. Um, but I'd say the main thing is that my best friend's deaf since I was about six, seven years old, still to this day. And so obviously I was aware of the deaf community um, through him and uh, you know, it just wanted to tell the story. And by sheer coincidence, I also direct branded content. My first year of directing, 12 years ago or something, I directed a commercial campaign about high school football teams. And one of them was Maryland School for the Deaf. And I felt like a bigger story needed to be told. And I basically stayed in touch with the school for 10 years, trying to get it made and forming a bond and a trust um, and visiting them every year when I'd visit my family. And, and finally, uh, 
Netflix came aboard and, and helped me realize it. And was it always going to center on Amare or was he someone you sort of discovered in this process? Yeah, so because I always, it's a coming of age film, right? So I always wanted to center on a senior, especially for the deaf community. You're, you're a senior at a deaf high school. You're going to graduate and go out into the hearing world. So it's a really pivotal coming of age moment. So um, basically every year I'd have to recast because they'd graduate. And I'm glad it took that long because it took me to Omari. And what I loved about Omari is that his story um, really told uh, in a dramatic way what can happen, right, um, to, to some deaf people. His relationship with his father um, and his friend Teddy, I don't want to give too much away as a cautionary tale. I think uh, it, right when I met him and, and, and heard him, his story, I, I knew uh, we needed to make it. You know, in both the two films we've talked about so far, it's one of those things where truth is so much stranger than fiction, you know? And I feel like if you had written these as narrative films, people might not have believed them. Yeah, yeah, the universe spoke. <laughs> uh, Pedro and John, in Lead Me Home, you have over two dozen subjects who tell their stories of homelessness. How did you first get to know this community and what made you want to tell this story? Yeah, um, thank you. And, and thank, you, thank you again, IDA, for, for having us today. We're, we're so proud to be part of this group. Um, you know, in, in the film, Lead Me Home, you meet people like um, Lewis, who's one of our kind of main characters, you could say. And um, this is a guy who, you know, kind of goes through life a lot like the rest of us. He, he, um, he has to do all the same things that we do, shower, find food, uh, you know, deal with his possessions, uh, try to find work and that kind of thing. Um, but at night he goes to sleep in a tent underneath a freeway. And that freeway happens to be about a mile and a half from where I live in my very comfortable home where I go to bed each night. And that's where the genesis of the film came is that Pedro and I, live in San Francisco and Los Angeles. And my partner, Bonnie and I um, live together in San Francisco. And, you know, we, we make films about all sorts of things all over the world. And it just dawned on us one day, like, hey, wait a minute, there's this very misunderstood issue right here, literally on our block. And um, Pedro and I set out to do two things, really, really fundamentally to humanize the, the this kind of giant, seemingly intractable issue that, that, that we're all living with as Americans now. And secondly, to, to kind of, you know, in a poetic way, to try to show the scale of it and to kind of zoom out and really remind people just how pervasive and um, endemic this issue is now. Um, so those are the two things that we set out to do and, you know, really led us to uh, really pretty quickly to the social workers who who are kind of on the front lines of this. And most of the words that you hear spoken in the film are actually being spoken to frontline workers who are talking to folks on, on the streets and through them, you really just hear these incredible, very varied stories of, of why people are experiencing this. Pedro, I'm curious with the two of you sort of working as a team, I mean, do you sort of come up with ideas together? <clears throat> or does, you know, has there ever been a situation where you had, to, one of you had to convince the other to sort of take on a topic? <laughs> well, uh, I mean, I'll, uh, I'll go on a limb. There's a bit of a Vulcan mind meld happening. Um, you know, I was, I was lucky enough to, to work with John uh, uh, and Bonnie um, on uh, John's uh, 2011 film, The Island President, which I, which I edited. And um, we, you know, we're kindred spirits. We have, you know, very similar sensibilities, and um, and we we felt really passionate about this topic. And I think so. When we went out and you know, we film filming together was a uh, a real you know a real treat and pleasure. And also there was a, a, a was already a shorthand there. Um, and so we every decision I think we came to together, um, and it was a. Uh, it felt really natural. And John is the most extraordinary cinematographer, um, you know, living uh, today. So I, it, that was to to have that um, 
you know, to be able to collaborate with him, not only as a co-director, but as also as a, you know, the, this extraordinary cinematographer who we, we really wanted to craft something visually to help shift the perspective, to help, you know, humanize this issue and really, and shift our collective perspective from the a perspective that we've, we've been making invisible for, you know, so, so long. And so um, we re that's really sort of the, the work that we set out to do together. I want to talk about each of your shooting styles since you mentioned the beautiful cinematography because in filmmaking particularly documentaries some people utilize narration some people do talking heads some choose kind of a more cinema verite style i'm sort of curious how each of you sort of came to the way that your films were made i mean in the case of camp confidential you chose to make it animated which is so fascinating can you kind of talk about that choice sure um so you talk about collaboration. We've been working together for the past <laughs> 15, 16 years. And yeah, and so he had to convince me with animation totally. because yeah, because we're, you know, we are archive lovers. I mean, we, all of our previous works has been, you know, heavily based on archives. And when we heard the interviews and we understood that there is uh, about, let's say 15 stills photos and all of the rest was destroyed. And so we had to find a way. And, you know, and when he pitched to me the idea of animation, it really was in one language at the end of the day with our previous works where, you know, it's very important for us that our viewers will be inside the story, you know, that they will go through the experience that our characters are going through the film. And, to see those testimonies that they have, you know, describing comes to life with a swimming pool. And I mean, you know, this is such a, I mean, ironic story and so surrealistic. So to combine it with animation, it was, you know, it was a perfect uh, combination to really, to really shift those, those moments of irony, of surrealism of the story. Uh, of Nazis and Jewish refugees that escaped from Europe, you know, two years before they had suddenly to interrogate them and then to recruit them uh, to the US while their family has been murdered in the Holocaust uh, in Europe all in the same time. What we also really enjoyed with animation was the fact that when you hear the story, these refugees start out as these like perfect, picture perfect, almost too perfect patriots. Mm -hmm. They're dreaming of like, you know, representing America and taking revenge on the evildoers. And it starts very much like, you know, Captain America. And this illusion is so comic book style, this kind of almost like moronic 2D kind of perspective of the world. and. As they start going into it, they understand that now they actually have a new enemy, which are the Russians, and they're not really fighting against the evildoers, but they are aligning with them and recruiting them. And then the irony of the animation is turned in its head, and you slowly understand that, you know, it started out as this very patriotic thing, and, you know, it's just an illusion because they find themselves doing something that they're very ashamed of. Mm -hmm. So that's animation for us. But the, the biggest achievement was really the fact that we could, for the first time in our life as documentary filmmakers, tell the animators, oh, we'd love a shot of that. And they would just <laughs> draw it. And we didn't have to stalk out our characters day and night in the cold or go through archives cursing. It was just, they just painted it. It was bliss. Give us a swimming pool. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> How much convincing did you need more in, to do the animation? Or was it, was it a pretty easy conversion for you? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was because, you know, it, it took me a, a few minutes and minutes, it, it minute, took, I mean, it was a month of shouting. Yeah, <laughs> yes, yes, you know, but, but, but 
our relationship is evolving. You know, if in the <laughs> first films we were like, okay, we're going to divorce after after every film. Now it's like uh, experience of. Uh, you know, <laughs> uplifting and and we're really no, we're really proud of this film. Really, really proud. And uh, and I love it that he convinced me. And you know, but once he convinced me into going with animation, it was just like the process in animation is so long, and the process was absolutely you know challenging and so creative really to to make this story come to life was was absolutely a, an amazing experience matt can you talk a little about the style of audible and and you know it's communicated entirely through sign language was that you know an active choice you made did you get any resistance on that no i mean uh, i mean going to the style i always knew i wanted to make an immersive film, something like an audio visual experience, especially with sound because of what it's about. So I wanted to make sound a character. And so you go from silence at points to very vibrant, saturated and muffled and distant um, to show sort of the spectrum of sound. Um, and then visually, I, I spent a lot of time talking to the kids, talking to Amari, anything from what music do you listen to to, and I'm not gonna explain how he listens to music, you have to watch the film. <laughs> uh, uh, um, you know, I wanted to create a look and feel that came from them that was very much teenagery and coming of age. So it, instead of it feeling um, for this film observational, I wanted to make it feel more immersive, like it's them telling their story. I'm just a conduit, right? Um, so I got some of the style from from based on them and colors and the way they dream and things they talked about. And obviously, there there must be so much trust between you and your subjects, particularly Amari. Did it take long to build that, or did you feel he trusted you instantly? It was pretty quick. I mean, certainly for a teenager just opening up to an adult that they've never met before. But no, it was pretty quick. And I think a lot of that came from what I said earlier, of, of even though he wasn't there, spending 10 years with the school, um, visiting. You know, I, I met him when he was still a junior, coming back, um, my friend being deaf, my aunt being a sign language interpreter, an ASL interpreter at Maryland School for the Deaf, I think all helped. And just, I mean, like everyone on this, on this Zoom, just the experience of making other films and knowing how to connect with people um, anywhere in the world, you know, just just uh, put in our 10,000 hours. And um, yeah, so he opened up pretty quickly. Um, and, and to answer your question about sign language, you know, I didn't want to put in voiceovers and stuff like that. It's their death. I want it's their story. You, you certainly hear some hearing voices in there from their parents and a few speaking people, but I think 95% of it is is in an ASL and I wanted to keep it that way and then use sound and visual um, to give you that, you know, more to listen to, um, things they feel. You know, I try to make you feel something, even in the music, a lot of dissonance and bass sounds because they feel vibrations, right? You know, there's, their other senses are heightened. And so I wanted to try to mimic that in some way. And Pedro and John, how did you sort of decide on your shooting style? What were those discussions like between the two of you? Well, it's, it's really interesting because, you know, coming into it, John and I are, are huge fans of the, the 1980s documentary, Koyana Skopsi, the, the Red oh, right. And so in a way that, that documentary was, you know, was a watershed moment in the environmental, um, you, you know, environmental documentaries and the environmental movement and kind of really helped shift a certain perspective. Um, and so we, beginning to approach the project, we talked about sort of, you know, that epic scale that th those vistas and, you know, approaching it with from that lens. But I think one of the things that we also wanted to do with it in the human, you know, in the humanity and bringing the humanity in um, was very intimate verite. We wanted to um, do a, a very stark juxt juxtaposition between 
sort of the scope and the scale and the intimacies of each individual story. Um, and that's something that we really kind of worked to, to hone in that sort of the, the intimate and the, and the epic, the macro, right? Um, and, um, and actually going along with, um, you know, what, you know, Matt's beautiful, beautiful, extraordinary film is also here a sound, it plays such a huge role. Um, from, you know, by shifting our perspective to, you know, to the perspective of someone who's having to live in the, on the streets, you understand that the soundscapes of the city play a huge, you know, huge part in creating that, um, the, the world that you live in from the minute you wake up to when you're brushing your teeth to when, uh, you know, to when you're getting some food. Um, and so the sounds of the city became sort of building blocks also for the music. So we, we had an incre incredible collaboration with our composer Gil Talmy where we would send him like the sounds that were recorded on our shoots and say like, let's create, let these sounds become the foundations of the music cues to take us on that journey um, of you know, day to night. And then we wanted to do, I think at the core of this journey was the things that going back to basics, the things that unite us all, you know, as I said, like waking up, you know, brushing your teeth, having coffee, grabbing something to eat, going to the market, you know, you know, buying food for the family, um, going to bed, um, you know, you know, falling in love. And so th that's the experience of the film. It's so going back to basics from morning to night. Um, and that's what we wanted to, that was sort of our driving force in creating something the experiential that gets back to the basics of our human experience. And similar to the question I asked Matt, John, I'm curious, um, you know, these subjects, these people seem to put a lot of trust in the two of you. How did you, you know, was it, was it ever challenging or did you find most people were willing to open up to you? We were actually amazed by, um, how, I, 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 let, me, let me start another way. You know, when we, when we normally walk down the street and experience people experiencing homelessness, I think I'll, it's just kind of human instinct to um, try to figure out a way to move through it as fast as we can, right? Um, I, I, I hate to admit it, but you know, um, that's, that, 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 that was my perspective. And I think Pedro and I talked a, a lot about that. And it's very dehumanizing. It actually feels terrible as the person passing. And I'm sure it feels terrible for people who are experiencing homelessness. Although we're all kind of used to living in a strange world that we've, that we've now created for ourselves. Um, as soon as we broke that barrier and stopped and looked people in the eye, by and large, people just kind of accepted like, oh, this person wants to engage. They wanna hear my story. Um, and of course, we had the amazing helping hand and guidance of um, several organizations in all three cities that we shot in that, that you know, um, were these social workers who go out onto the, to the streets to really um, assess the situation of individuals out there, um, really help guide us and, um, you know, kind of for security reasons and all that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, by and large, we, it, we were just kind of amazed at how quickly people wanted to share their story and um, wanted the world to know that they were human and that they, they, each of them had their own story. One technique you see in the film, we kind of found by happenstance, it turns out that there's kind of a common assessment that many social um, uh, groups that are, that are working on in, in the homeless services um, space use to kind of assess the vulnerability of folks that are out there. It's called a vulnerability assessment interview, intake interview. And so we realized early on that we could just simply place a camera in front of um, people who are experiencing homeless, uh, uh, homelessness and have the social worker just do that interview, but this time on camera. And that's why you see, you mentioned that we had a number of subjects in the film, I think upwards of 20 or so. And, and we realized we could, in kind of a rapid fire way, we could get a lot of personal information and stories out there from the, the, the variety of folks that are experiencing this, this um, homelessness on the West Coast. And you see that in the film and there's just some beautiful emotional moments that happen instantly. You know, like as soon as they ask a question, for example, do you have family that you're in touch with? Some people just start to cry because yeah. that is a big source of trauma in their life. Or, you know, why, why are you sleeping on the streets? And you see it in their eyes. You see, you see the, 
you see the, the humanity instantly. And so that became kind of a, a thread that, that runs throughout the film. Kind of an odd question, but I believe you started shooting this in 2017. Uh, how did you sort of know when you were done? Was the, you know, with the other two films have an endpoint, they have an arc, but for your film, how did you sort of know it was finished? I, I don't know if we have different answers. Certainly, you know, the pandemic hit in early 20 and then, and we realized that that, that was kind of a, it is a, it's a, a watershed event and, and obviously in world history now, but um, it, it, it'll have its own ramifications that it, it has and will continue to have on, on the issue of, of the economy and therefore people experiencing homelessness. And so we realized that that was kind of a natural way to end the film, that, that we could have our last shoot occur at the beginning of the pandemic and just sort of leave people with a, you know, the hint of, of how, the, how this problem, you know, could potentially be quite exacerbated by, by, you know, the forces of the pandemic. Pedro, you'd agree with that? <laughs> well, hundred percent. Yeah. No, I th it, it felt like um, once the pandemic hit it, um, it, it just, uh, because we had it also the, so much by that point, we, we had so much uh, incredible, you know, uh, material from all, you know, the extraordinary perspectives from incredible people. But I think it was one of the things that we wanted to sort of end the note with, uh, you know, what could be, you know, like it kind of almost leaving us with a question is like, you know, what kind of society do we want to be? And I felt like that the pandemics really, the beginning of the pandemic really kind of raises that question. And, and it's really, it's, the film is, is really sort of an invitation for us to continue a certain conversation, right? to um and to kind of help shift a certain perspective and i it, we felt like that as john said the beginning of the pandemic provided that question for us i'm curious um for for each of you are you in touch with any of the subjects today uh, daniel and more um you know have they been able to see your film and sort of what was their response to it yeah absolutely uh jono and benji our producers i mean they were, we were very fortunate because there are only two survivors that we know of that are still alive to tell the story. All the rest you, done those interviews and passed away. Most of them has opened the window to this testimonies only in those interviews that we're exposing for the first time here in the film. So, uh, so yes, and so Peter saw the film a couple of uh, days ago. He loved it. And we got a picture of him seeing the film. It was very, very moving for us because those, you know, those people that our characters are really, it's a voice that haven't been heard yet. And to allow them to tell the story after carrying this baggage on them for so many years, because, you know, I mean, the film raises such, for us, really engaging and important moral questions with the film. And as Peter said in the film, and I'm sure that that was, you know, his, also his emotional, like, uh, uh, baggage that he carried with him is, you know, they were refugees, they wanted to save America, they wanted to save their families in Europe, but then eventually, you know, like Peter is asking, is it worthwhile of doing, you know, achieving a good end, a good cause, but doing it, you know, uh, doing it in, with very, you know, like, um, with bad ways, for with, sure. With bad ways, you yeah. know, as collaborating, at the end of the day with the Nazi regime because uh, those people, you know, von Braun and the scientists that came from Europe to the US and were recruited to the US uh, was never accounted for their crimes. On the contrary, they were, you know, looked as heroes. It, it also really, I mean, for me, it, it taps in to what you said about the people experiencing homelessness in the sense that for them, nobody wanted to hear their story because 
you know, people are trying to avoid and they have all this shame. And here it was really an institutional shame. So the US was so ashamed of this collaboration and a collaboration, of course, that is still going on today with different dark regimes that the US is collaborating with. Um, but back then, the way was not to look the other way, but really to sense it and silence it. And most of these people really took their secret to their graves and they were coping their whole life with that feeling of shame. Like each time they looked up into the sky and you know, saw the moon, they thought about that moon landing that was a lot to do with them, but um, they only saw the shame in it. Mm. So, yeah. Matt, for you, what is it like? Um, I mean, does, does Amori get that he's like a movie star now? And what's it like for him and his family and friends, you know, to see all that play out? Yeah, they love it. I, he, it hasn't gone to his head, though. Um, uh, but yeah, he loves it. They're very proud of it. You know, as everyone on here knows, you know, you're making a film and often the subjects, they don't understand production and filmmaking and they don't know necessarily what it's going to look like or how you're putting it together. Um, and so they were very surprised in a good way, especially Janelle, as you asked earlier about the, the visual and language of it, you know, how, it, how it, the film language, how it looked visually. Um, yeah, they really liked it. And I do stay in touch with Amari and the other kids and coaches in school all the time. I mean, I did for 10 years. Why stop now? Where, where's Amari now? What's he up to? Amari is going to go to college. He took a year off and actually is getting into wrestling, not football. Yeah. And he is trying, getting into like um, deaf Paralympic wrestling. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, and the other, you know, um, a lot of the kids, pop, partly because of the proximity, end up when they graduate. I mean, they go to different places, but a lot of them go to Gallaudet University, which is the only deaf university, and it's only 30, 40 minutes away in D.C. So um, some of the other kids, like Lyra, his on-again, off-again girlfriend, goes to Gallaudet. Um, Jalen, our, 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 our cheerleader uh, character, goes to Gallaudet and has really interesting, uh, big life change that happens that um, I would let... Uh, I'll let him speak to that um i don't want to speak for someone else in a good way uh sounds like you might have a new movie uh, absolutely yeah <laughs> there's, there's a spin-off absolutely and i am looking we're talking about expanding audible into um perhaps a, a series oh that's great yeah pedro and john for the two of you i mean um i would think when your subjects are homeless you have to uh, be concerned that you might not be able to track them down again, you know, when you're making your film. Have you been able to keep in touch with any of them? Have they seen the film? We have. Uh, we, we've been fortunate that we've been able to keep, uh, to keep in touch with many of them. Uh, and, and actually, you know, a couple of them, Lewis and Roro even came into to the office and, and they, um, they watched the film uh, together and it was, uh, and John can speak to that because it was a very emotional experience for them. And, um, and you know, I think when, when you live your life and being invisible and being sort of dehumanized and I think seeing yourself on, you know, and on screen and being seen in a certain way, I think it, it uh, it's, it's it's quite an emotional experience, um, right, John? Well, how, I mean, you were there. I I, I was on speakerphone and because uh, it was in San Francisco, I'm in LA. Yeah, it, it was it was incredible to to be able to share the film with um, Lewis and Roro and some of our other um, the participants in, in the film, and and we have we have kept up with them. Surprisingly, one of the one of the things that that. We have in common is many many uh, people experiencing homelessness still maintain their cell phone um, connection because that's a, kind of a lifeline for so many um, for so many of them to stay in touch with uh, whether it's a job or healthcare or you know that kind of thing they really need that um, so we we've, we've been able to maintain contact for the most part with people and 
tell them that the film is now finally after four years of, of, of work is finally getting out there into the world on on the festival circuit and then at the end of the month on Netflix. So um, it's been just exciting um, to maintain those relationships and also kind of live live the live the ups and downs of the, the drama that is going on in their life along with them. Well, I want to thank you all so much for being here today and congratulate you on these beautiful movies. I really want to thank Netflix for, you know, um, giving these stories to a global audience. I think it's really exciting. More and more people I know who didn't used to watch documentaries or even shorts are now watching both. And I think that's really exciting. Sure. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you all so much for being here. And again, congratulations. Thank you. Thanks, Chanel. Thanks, IDA. Congrats to everybody. Thank you very much. Honor us. to be here. Congratulations, everyone. Did I pronounce yeah. everyone's names right? Okay, good. Yes. Excellent. Hey, hey, is it, you said we could jump in if there was one thing we forgot to say. <laughs> I say yeah, I, you, you would have to edit this in. Janelle, something you asked me, I forgot to say it went about how they took the film. It was really important for us that we weren't just making the film for a hearing audience. Certainly, I'm, I'm hoping the hearing world you know, steps through the window and, and learns about their world and is part of their world. But it was, um, it, we made the film as much or maybe even more so for the deaf community. And that's why I really kind of made it with them because I wanted to make sure that we honored them and, and kind of let them tell their stories.